Good evening and welcome to Our Natural Rights here on alltalkradio.net. As has been occurring in the last couple of shows, we have some visitors who think it's their business to decide what goes out over the broadcast media, and so we're running a little bit of late and running without introductory music, and it is what it is. But I'm really excited tonight because my guest is a gentleman who I am grateful to be able to call a friend. His debut interview took place here on Our Natural Rights in March of this year. I'd like to welcome Mark Sargent to the show. Thanks, Mark, for being here and for hanging in through the glitch this afternoon. <laughs> no problem, Michelle. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's a delight. Most people who are in the audience now or who will be watching in archives have some awareness of the subject matter, so we really don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Suffice it to say, Mark's Flat Earth Clues series on YouTube has reached thousands and thousands of people with a very logical approach where each short video builds upon the one prior to it. It's a perfect primer for seeing the Earth is not a globe, and I highly recommend it. Mark is now regarded as one of the stalwarts of the Flat Earth community, having taken this subject into the real world lately, especially with his strange world interviews uh, with some very, very interesting professional people. So I'd really like to start there, Mark, if you would, and kind of update us on these professionals who've come in and supported the premise here. Sure, uh, happy to do it. The The whole premise started when I did Clue 10, I believe, where I was really asking for anybody in the professional sector to come out and talk about their take on, it, you know, could they confirm or not confirm whether we lived on a globe or not. And again, for people who are just listening to this for the first time, it sounds crazy, it sounds insane, but that's what I proposed to the internet back in February. I basically said, look, tell me how you know it's a globe. In fact, better than that, show me how you know it's a, a, a globe. And by the time I got to Clue 10 in my Flat Earth Clue series, I was asking for anybody to come forward. And let's be honest, I wasn't exactly optimistic when I put this out there because I didn't think, you know, who, who's going to come out and actually talk about this and put their neck on the line? Right. And I had people contacting me just a few months ago. It took a little while. Uh, it took really until the end of the summer, and I was first contacted by a member of the United States Navy, uh, a Sparrow Missile System instructor, as a matter of fact. He's currently in 10 years. He's trying to go for life. I don't know if he's going to make it. He might get a Section 8 before this is over. <laughs> because, but I, but I think that's part of the trap, which is great. I think he's very, very smart, which, and his name, he, he wasn't even anonymous. He went out, and, and his name's Sean McCrary. Right. And it's a really clever thing that he did because... If they try to throw them out on a Section 8, for example, and they say, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going to throw you out. Well, why? Well, because you think the Earth is flat. And he'd be like, really? Because I'll be willing to take a psychological profile, and I can tell you I'm not insane. So if I'm not insane, but I say the Earth is flat, is it true? And he, <laughs> came, he came out and basically said, not only, and he verified everything, you know, he showed me live footage of him flying to the Iwo Jima. Uh, the his ship that the amphibious assault vehicle, uh, assault ship, he showed me which he probably shouldn't have uh, footage from inside the the Sparrow missile system training room, you know there's only one of those in the whole country, and he came out and said in three he took three big points and he says first off he goes with all the advanced instruments that we use on this ship and we have access to, to just about everything. We cannot see a curve anywhere, and we're out in the middle of the ocean where it's about as flat as you can get on all sides. Mm -hmm. He also said that there's no Coriolis effect, and that means the spinning of the Earth, and that in our weapon systems and the firing solutions, everything from the missiles they use, and he's a specialist, remember, and he trains people in these missile systems. He's been doing it for 10 years now. Uh, there's no Coriolis effect. And not only is there no Coriolis effect taken into account with his missile system, but none of the systems for any of the ships that he can vouch for. And that not only that, but he goes into the navigation in the Southern Hemisphere. He goes, navigation is all wrong. The charts are all wrong. He is the destinations. It's very, very much exaggerated when they get to the Southern Hemisphere. And he couldn't explain it other than he goes, look, the flat model is what it appears to be. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was fascinating. A, a quick example, because I know you want to go through some of these, um, was um, – that they can paint targets. The big one was he can paint targets. The The Sparrow missile system isn't an auto-guide system. You have to paint the target with a two-inch beam radar, and then the missile picks up on that and, and zeroes in on its target. And he goes, we're picking, we're painting targets at 60 miles. You know, 50 nautical miles or about 58 land miles, statute miles. Mm -hmm. 
we're painting targets at 60 miles. And he goes, but that's thousands of feet below the curve. How are we hitting this, this ship if we can't even supposedly see it? The problem is they can see it with their long range binoculars. They can see these things. Right. And he goes at night with night vision and mirage. You know, if you want to say it's a mirage, fine. What are they painting and destroying? Uh, are they painting mirages with a two inch beam radar? And what's the missile locking down to? Because I can guarantee a radar is not bouncing off a mirage. <laughs> It's crazy what the amount of stuff he was he was coming out. And because he came out, uh, he opened the door for a whole bunch of people. And in fact, even even I, I gave him every chance in the world to be anonymous. And he decided to even he not not only did he he made sure his face was all over the place, mm -hmm. but he made his own YouTube channel, and his YouTube channel was his name, Sean McCrary, sort of like mine is Mark K. Sargent. And he's been just getting thousands and thousands of, of messages and lots of people have been hitting him up for, for information. And he's great. No one can debunk him. No one's come back and say he's a fraud. He's not. He's absolutely legit. Because of him, other military people have been coming out. Uh, right after he came out, you know, so after people were listening to Sean, uh, I had a submarine chief electronics chief. I'm yeah. sorry, chief, chief electronics technician. He's, he was career. He did his tour on five different classes of subs. And he comes out and says, yeah, he goes, he goes, Sean's absolutely right. Uh, and these guys are both Navy, but they didn't know each other. And he goes, I goes, I was in for 20 years. And, and I can tell you the firing solutions aren't there. The curvature isn't there because the submarine is just an airplane in the water, mm -hmm. underneath the water. Right. He goes, he goes, there's no, there's no curvature. We use the same gyro, the same gyroscope system. There, there's no accounting for any of that. Uh, and then they started, then I did a show where they were, they came on the same show together and started comparing notes. And they were saying stuff like, like, uh, like the, the submarine guy said he never knew a submarine guy, another submarine guy that worked in the Southern Hemisphere, for example. That, that, was, that was really interesting. They both had heard of people that were stationed in Antarctica, but they couldn't – There were you never saw an opening where you could get stationed yourself. You know, like they're like military. There's like like it's like the the, the classifieds in a newspaper. Yeah. You could say, hey, you want to be stationed here and there. There's never an opening in Antarctica. It's he goes. It's like they're hand picked. And he goes. He goes. And they knew people in, you know, the army and the navy. He goes. It's got to be Air Force. The amount of people that's down there, which would make sense because they, you know, that's that's where you would get most of your people. Sure. Uh, you, that's how you get them down there. But those two, do you want me to keep going? Oh, sure. Let's let's do the surveyor. That was fascinating. Uh, the surveyor was fascinating, too. And so surveyor listens to those guys. And this was a career surveyor out of, I believe it was Indiana. In fact, I know it was Indiana. And But I think he was uh, he's currently living now in Colorado. And he was in for 32 years. And he had done commercial tracts of land. So he wasn't surveying, you know, your driveway and, and, and a new... <laughs> you know, a foundation for a house or anything. He was right. doing 20 mile tracks of land for like uh, car factories, airport runways, uh, shopping malls, big, big tracks. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what a surveyor is, he's the guy that comes out before the foundation is even laid. And he's the one that determines how the ground is, uh, how it slopes and where the elevation is. And basically he's looking for flat planes. And he comes out and he goes, he goes, you're never going to believe this when I tell you this, because I've been doing it for 32, or I did it for 32 years, just retired a few years ago. But he said that the instructions when he was first starting out was, and, and all surveyors will attest to this, you treat the world, your, your surveying project, you treat it like it's a perfectly flat plane, like it's flat as a book. And he goes, he goes, which is great because it makes it easier, right? That's, that's how you treat it. You just, you know, your four corners or whatever you're going to do. And he goes, that's, that's a great idea in theory. The problem is, is sooner or later, somebody's going to have to deal with a curve. For example, if you're building a city and from one end of the, the city to the other, you're talking miles and miles. Well, these projects, if there's a curve, it's eight inches per mile squared. It's like, and the analogy I gave, and I, I think it still holds, is that it's like trying to cover a basketball with wheat thins, you know, those perfectly square crackers. Absolutely, that, and that was a beautiful analogy because it, it does help people recognize that this guy's data has to butt up against somebody else's data at some point. You have to be able to put these plots together. Yes, absolutely true. And it's, so if you try to cover a basketball wheat thins, I thought of this when I was hungry, and I like wheat thins. <laughs> and he, what, what happens is is you can cover it, of course, but there's going to be gaps right. because you can't cover a curved surface without using curved pieces. 
And he was going, look, none of these pieces that we worked on ever screw they they never had a conflict with another piece of piece of of land so when he worked on his big square flat square he would butt up against another big flat square and with everything would line up perfectly and you're thinking well where he goes eventually sooner or later somebody would have to take into account the curve especially if the track of land was big enough so he goes even by accident you should run into people that would would accident oh did you take into account curve no i did but you didn't right, right. You, that 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 conversation never happened 32 years it never came up in conversation ever anywhere where the curvature was actually being used. And we're talking massive tracts of land. I think he did the Toyota factory out in Indiana. And he goes, that was a 20 mile track. He goes, he goes the curve was never taken into account. 20 miles, that's a massive uh, amount of curve that you're gonna have to build into the foundation. And it was it was fascinating to lead, uh, to listen to because he was, was he, he like a lot of people, and we'll get into the others later, was under, you know, it was, he was amazed that he missed it. And yeah. he, and, and I, how did I, he goes, I can't believe I went through 32 years of surveying and never even thought about it. And they, because people say, well, how, how is everybody missing this? It's because they do, because nobody thinks about it because we're conditioned so early. Sure. Uh, and it, and it was, the, the classic response is, well, you just didn't work with a big enough area to encounter the curve. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. always, that's always the pat answer. Um, yeah. When you say uh, eight inches per mile squared, that yes. that is the the trigonometry for measuring a sphere, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, and is it, that is that based on is, has NASA shared that with us, or is that something? We oh no, no, that's standard. That any university professor will be able to tell you that. Okay. Uh, except for the one, uh, the astrophysicist from Exeter, which apparently forgot it when we, <laughs> we were talking to him, and I I shouldn't give him too hard a time, but I mean the guy specializes in in spheroids. And he didn't, he said, oh, it was eight inches per mile. It's like, no. So people don't understand. It's eight inches per mile. Okay, so if you wanted to, like your stairs, when you're going up and down stairs, mm -hmm. that is a certain distance per foot. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, like a 10 inch drop or whatever it is, every stair. So it's a perfect slope. It's, you know, it, like, like the side of a pyramid. Right. But when you do a curvature, it has to get bigger and bigger as you get further out because eventually it's going to drop up vertical as you as you get out to the edge of a sphere. So eight inches per mile squared means eight inches times every mile times itself. So if you if you go out three miles, for example, it's three miles times itself. So three times three is nine. And then you take that and you multiply it times eight inches, which is nine times eight is 72. So 72 inches of curve after three miles okay. but it just gets you know steeper and steeper as you get further along sure and a lot of people get scared when they when they first hear that or they just their eyes glaze over because nobody nobody likes trigonometry <laughs> and and i agree eight inches per mile even the wikipedia entry which is really interesting only says eight inches per mile they don't even say it's per mile squared yeah. but it's but it's the point is is it's wrong it doesn't really matter. You don't have to remember it or not because it's just not there. So everyone's been like at 50 miles, for example, 50 miles is 50 times 50 times eight inches, which is about 1700 feet between 1600 and 1700 feet. And what's interesting about that is, and we've been going over this for months now in the flat earth community is that like the Chicago skyline. Exactly. From the, the east shore but, of Lake but, Michigan. There you go. 50 yeah. miles away mm -hmm. should be about 1,700 feet below the curvature, which means you shouldn't be able to see any of the skyline. And you do. You see it very clearly. Absolutely. It's not wavering. It's not upside down. It's not flickering. The lights are all there. And people saying, you know, the news guy comes on and says, oh, no, it's a mirage. It's like, Ugh. well, OK, fine. You want to call that a mirage? <laughs> then tell me what's happening with the ships when you say when you claim that when a ship goes off into the distance the hull starts disappearing first and then the mass goes second because you can't cherry pick you can't have it both ways that's you can't right. say that's a mirage and, but you, you can't say that that's not a mirage and chicago is it's either they're both mirages or they're both real and either way you're in trouble if you try to go down that road that's right. uh, but but sean mccrary's uh, the the united states navy missile instructor i think he blows that out of the water no play on words there <laughs> uh, quite literally because if he's painting a target at 60 miles which is way further than than a 50 mile you know that's three thousand something feet below the uh below the curvature mm -hmm. Then, what is he hitting? 
if he's not hitting something. And he said, and he, the 60 miles, he only told me that because that's, he can't even give the official, uh, uh, decla- you know, the, the classified version of how it goes out. Uh, same thing with the, the, the submarine guy, he's shooting torpedoes. The, the minimum distance on those things are 25 miles. Most people don't know that 25 miles. Not only does it, should it take in the, the, um, uh, the Coriolis effect, but it also should account for the curvature of the earth, even though it's technically just below the surface. It's uh, it's crazy the amount of uh, of stuff that's being released right now. Absolutely, um, and snipers never account for oh, a curve. Don't, you know, don't, don't get me started on the snipers. <laughs> snipers, there's a big problem with the snipers because mainstream media, especially with those movies out the last couple of years, the one with Bradley Cooper was really yes, good. Yeah. But even I don't think he even talked about it in the movie. Where there's a couple of people that said, oh yeah, and you know again if it's on mainstream, then you know there's a problem. Mainstream comes out and says, oh yeah, the snipers have to take into account the Cor- Coriolis effect, the spinning of the globe, at at one mile. And it's like really, because I've got two artillery guys, one in Fallujah, one in Art- one in Afghanistan. They're firing artillery howitzers at 30 miles. They're not doing anything. I've got a Navy guy shooting missiles at 60 miles. He's not doing the Coriolis effect. Uh, not to mention, I've got a, a United States Marine Corps uh, instructor who says that he taught uh, sniper school for three years. The, it's not there. The Coriolis effect is not there. And let's just throw one more into the mix, and that is fine. Even if you said that the, the Coriolis effect was taken into account on these guys, then what the heck is a plane doing when it's flying and, and coming into a landing strip? Because a plane is just really just one large projectile. Right, flying right. a little slower than an artillery shell. Does does the Coriolis effect not affect planes, but it does affect bullets? <laughs> oh, just it's just nobody. Everyone's basically the same. The same thing though, especially in the military. And that, by that I mean the army, uh, the navy. I don't have air force. I'm looking for them, still. But they're all saying the same thing, and that is everyone's heard of the Coriolis effect. They've all heard of the curve, but nobody. They don't use it in real life. They don't use it in their nine to five jobs. It's just it's a myth. And it it's is, been- and it's probably, you know, in some training manual, in some footnote at the end of the book somewhere, but they're never teaching it. They don't yeah. have to account for it. They're not yeah. using it. So, yeah. yeah, there may be a paragraph, like the like the surveyor said, there may be a paragraph that says, like he, he was saying that, because he asked when he was really young, right? He goes, well, what about the curvature? And they all the, all the older guys always said the same thing. They said, oh, don't worry about it. But they, they meant don't worry about it, literally, because... It's never taken into account when they're doing their projects. Yeah. And he was like going, and only now, you know, when you're young, you don't care. But now he's going, what do you mean don't worry about it? You have to worry about it. But they, but because they ignore it, it just, the problem went away. It's like, really? But, so if you ignore curvature, it just isn't there? Yeah, yeah, but see, this is the same mentality of the the pre-Van uh, Allen radiation belt uh, awareness and the post awareness because yeah. they were saying well we went to the moon but we didn't know about van allen so it didn't bother us so i yeah. guess if you don't know about it it ceases to be in existence yeah. is that how yeah. it works yeah 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 the van allen belts which i can't wait to you know when i go on my final you know my my, my big debate coming up with stanton friedman even though i think it's an odd choice to go up against me i'm looking for an astrophysicist and i get the world's best ufo researcher don't know how that works <laughs> But but the Van Allen belt, it's like, okay, so that NASA announces, NASA, yeah, keep that in mind, they announced the Van Allen radi- belt, radiation belts in 1959. Unfortunately, when they got to the point where they were going to have to supposedly send spaceships through it, they didn't have a, a, a solution, a lightweight solution for how to get past the belts. And the official NASA response is, oh, they just went really, really fast. <laughs> yeah, just floor it. And you'll get past it no problem, and you won't have to deal with it. Well, there's two problems there. The first one is, fine, let's say you did just gun it, right, and and made it through the belts, and you made it to the moon using all that rocket thrust. Well, what rocket thrust did you use coming home? Because, one, you you didn't have it if you were were coming back from the moon, and, two, you'd have to slow down because you're going home. You'd have to slow way, way down so you could finally delicately get into the Earth's atmosphere. At that point, you're really going through the the belts, if they're even there, which they are not. But the the second bigger one is the Orion Project, which I can't wait to see what Stanton's answer is for this, because I'm going to quote it verbatim, which is, 
they say, you know, NASA released a video just last year, if it wasn't this year, where Kelly Smith, their rep, comes out and because they're working on the Orion Project, the precursor to going to Mars. And they say, they describe the Van Allen belts in painful detail and say how that could affect guidance systems, all the electronics, not to mention people. And they say, we're going to have to solve this problem before we send people out into space. It's like, what? What do you mean solve this problem? You, you solved it 50 years ago. Why are you talking about this? In fact, why did you put that on film? It's not like it's a dated material from the 1980s or something like that. And not to mention, you did it in the 60s. Did you forget how to get through the Van Allen belts? It's, or did, it's, they, did they forget it was even an issue back then? It's Oh, it's just, my, well, it would answer some questions. And that is why hasn't since the moon why has no man supposedly ever gone to the moon or further since 1972 you know the, it the, if you say it's because of the van allen belts then how did you do and i was probably misquoted the last time we interviewed where um because it's actually apollo 8 through apollo 17 which is 10 full missions mm -hmm. it wasn't apollo 11 through 17 That's it was right. eight so 10 round trips through this thing because eight nine and ten apparently went to the moon circled around a few times and didn't take any pictures and then flew back for no apparent reason <laughs> So they went through 10 trips. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Nobody died. The capsules weren't contaminated. And the, the Van Allen radiation belts apparently weren't that big a deal. That's fine, except the Orion Project cares a great deal about them. And I've got the video and the audio. It's all over YouTube. It's not like it's a hidden document. They they put this on television. Uh, well, sorry. you know, you're not supposed to remember because we live in a world of 30-second attention span situations you know you're not supposed to remember what they said last week that's going to contradict what they say this week so to quote Anne Hathaway in the last Batman movie we, when it comes to the internet everything sticks everything if it's if you say it now in media it it it's, it gets put on the internet it is never going away that's right ever 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 so I yeah. thought it was uh, hysterical after some of you some of us whatever uh, started making noise about the belts that it was like a week later that somebody came out and said, oops, we accidentally drained the Van Allen radiation belts. <laughs> yeah. Hilarious. Yeah, it's, in fact, it's been amazing since we talked last, the amount of moves that are happening inside NASA and other circles. Uh, for example, the first blue marble shot, the first full lit shot of the Earth since 1972 was released in uh, late June, early July of this year. Yeah. Uh, which was amazing. Why, why? 43 years. It took them 43 years. All these satellites, the Hubble telescope, all these programs, nobody took a picture of the Earth until this topic started coming up. And all of a sudden, oh, look, here's a picture of the Earth. The uh, first one ever. The White House tweeted it. <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson tweeted it. And they actually went out of their way to say that, by the way, this first time we've done this in 43 years, confirming everything we were accusing them of in the first place. Exactly. Uh, the other stuff they've been doing, releasing stories every, it was every week, now it's every day. Every day a new NASA story is out there talking about, oh, here's what's happening on Pluto, here's Mars, here's Saturn, here's the Orion Project, here's what we're doing. No, you're not doing anything. And that mission to Mars crap that you keep talking about, uh, that's not going to happen. Don't think for a second that uh, Matt Damon's movie, The Martian, was, was an accident by any stretch. Oh, that not was... at all. Nor interstellar, nor nor gravity, yeah. nor, you yeah. know. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's again, I, I still think, even though people think it's one of my weaker clues, it was my first one, which was why are there no movies about the moon still this day? You know, fine. You're going to you're going to talk about every you're going to do space stuff about everything else, but you're not going to talk about the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it's uh, it's aggravating, but it's it's fun to see because there's a lot of. Oh, did you see, you see that one thing that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson did? Uh, where a, he, about the, uh, the, the, the the goal, the football the, goal? Yeah, the football. Oh, where, my where, gosh. Why doesn't he just insert himself into a Cheerios commercial or something? Oh, the Beng yeah, the, the, when the Bengals beat the Seahawks, there was a there was a field goal in, uh, I think it was overtime, or it was the end of the game. Mm -hmm. And Neil deGrasse Tyson tweeted the NFL and said that field goal kick hit the uprights and went in because the Coriolis, Coriolis effect. I like, about died laughing. I mean, I'm watching this live, and, and I'm going... I'm just screaming. I'm throwing pillows at the television. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I was going, first off, jocks don't want to hear about nerd science. Exactly. Right? That's, that's the first thing. So I don't know why you're tweeting the NFL because they're going to say, Who, who's saying that? Oh, some dumb scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I watched the game. 
And the, the, the other thing was, is that the Coriolis effect does not affect field goals on an oblong object that's only doing 40 yards. <laughs> it's kicked. How are you going to do Really hitting off the goalpost? That's what made the determination whether it went out or went in? Really? Oh, I was desperate. Desperate. By the way, he turned down the um, uh, the interview, you know, the, the debate with me. Oh, gee, that's, what a shock. That's how I ended up doing uh, uh, Stanton Friedman. He was good. He... he yeah, anyway, I shouldn't go into it. But anyway. Yeah, but we know that that you know their template is obfuscate, make fun of, deride, criticize, but never really answer the points ever. No no astrophysicist and granted there's only like 7 or 8,000 of them in the world. No astrophysicist will put their name on this debate anywhere. Uh, the closest I got was a German guy. I don't think he was even a full-blown physicist. He wanted to debate me on Skype on top of it. And I go, but he wanted to be anonymous. And I go, what are you talking about? <laughs> I go, I go you, I'm not hiding anything. Why should you? And I had a friend, uh, you know, who was, I, I wanted to bring on my show. She was a PhD. And she goes, it's because they worked so hard for their PhDs. They do not want to put them at jeopardy sure. by, by putting them out there. I was going, what if they have nothing to hide? You'd think that astrophysicist or an astronomer or somebody with a high degree of education would want to come out. But unfortunately, their only weapon they have against this is math. And they'll say, well, math is all it takes. Trigonometry is all it takes. That's how we can prove it. And I go, yeah, but what if the math was wrong to begin with? What if all the research and all the math, including the eight inches per mile squared, which seems pretty simple uh, in comparison, what if that was dead wrong? What if all, because people say, well, you're not smarter than, than Hawking or Einstein or Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm going, I don't have to be. Because their found the foundation that they built all their work on was flawed. Exactly. So now everybody's on a level playing field, the pun intended, mm -hmm. uh, be, because of what's happened now. They um, they don't then that's where they don't they don't know where to go with this because if you if they come out they're going to lose most of their audience if they try try to quote trigonometry they'll say well we know the distance of the sun because and the distance of the moon because of this and this and they're going to throw all this stuff out there and no one's going to get it. And All it, their, yeah, and it won't prove anything to anybody. So it, it won't prove anything to anybody. Yeah. So they're, they're lost. They don't know what to do. Well, sucks to be them, I guess. Agreed. <laughs> so um, your premise about where we live, I'd like to um, discuss that a little bit because you're somewhat unique from the perspective of, of the enclosed world. Yes. Um, and there are other theories and, you know, since since NASA and the military control everybody's access to anything that would prove it for sure, then mm -hmm. we're still left with these theories and, and lining things up that make sense through the experimentation that we've done, that type of thing. So um, explain why you believe that this is an enclosed world. I believe it's an enclosed world. And for, for the layman out there who's not quite getting it yet, what I the, the easiest ways to reference the 1998 Truman Show with Jim Carrey, and that is imagine if you had a planetarium, you know, the normal planetarium is only hundreds of yards wide. Imagine if you could build that thing out thousands of miles wide and hundreds of miles high. Could you keep an entire civilization inside that thing, provided you could deal with climate control and, and the oceans and everything underneath it? Could you hide an entire civilization from – keep it from finding out? Now, I believe in this model for several reasons. Uh, the most obvious would be uh, – well, I mean we could – let's, let's go to the biblical references just, just for the heck of it. And by that, for people that don't know, you know from the biblical side who might be listening, and that is the firmament, something talked about in Genesis. You know, the, in fact, Genesis 1, where the, 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 the firmament, a barrier separating the waters above and the waters below. Mm -hmm. uh, and then all the other, ch I'm not going to be able to quote chapter and verse, unfortunately, but where they, they keep mentioning time and time again, the earth is fixed, the earth does not move. Uh, the Tower of Babel, where's that going? Uh, how, did, how did Joshua, I think it was Joshua, um, uh, keep the sun in the sky for an extra day? It's a lot easier in an enclosed system. But for me, I believe it's enclosed for, for, for the, the big basic reason is because I don't think anyone that would build this structure is not, want to get, is not going to give the inhabitants free reign, meaning they are – it's, it's easier to control mechanically, first of all. 
because every, because you you keep everything in the in, in the system. I mean, the stars in the sky, the sun and the moon. Everything's easier in an enclosed system. Uh, the oceans are easier. The um, uh, the magma system's easier. The jet stream is e easier. All of it's easy. But you also want to protect what's in here, meaning uh, you, you protect them from a from a stance that yeah, people, you know, we're 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 vulnerable as a, as a species, but we're also dangerous. Uh, think of all the bad things we've done. We're good when it comes to a common cause, but when we don't have a common goal between all of us, we turn on each other very, very quickly. You don't want to let you don't want to let a group like ours just run amok outside of this place. So it just works out a lot better mm -hmm. when it's when it's enclosed. I mean, the other models that are out there, like the the infinite plane, it's fine. I don't hate it. But uh, I believe in a. It's it's easier to understand if it's enclosed. I think art imitates life, and I think life Im it imitates life. So if we would do it to someone like Truman in the Truman Show, and if we build planetariums to show people to simulate the stars and the sun and the moon, then why wouldn't somebody more advanced than us do the same thing to us? Mm -hmm. Well, do you perceive that somebody to be a benevolent uh, situation, or do you do you fall under the category where I think I'm falling and that that we are enclosed in more of a prison type structure rather than oh well the dome and the earth you know prove a creator and and we're so lucky to be quarantined <laughs> under this dome yeah yeah there is that um okay I try officially you know I try to keep the glass half full when I'm when I'm talking about it if it is a prison you know I don't want to use the term prison planet throw that around too loosely no no but but if it is a, if it is a confinement, because really can only be one of three things, uh, it's either a form of entertainment, a form of education, or a form of confinement. Now it could be a blending of those three, but two of these you kind of got to knock out pretty quick. And that is, if it's a form of entertainment, then uh, most of the people aren't really having that much fun. No. So I don't, I don't think that's it. If it's a form, if it's a, it's, if it's confinement. If it's straight up confinement, then you kind of want to make sure they kind of knew they were confined. You'd want to show the bars if you could, and they've gone to extreme lengths to make sure we have not, we did never knew we were being confined. The only other thing I could think of, and this is the part I kind of go into uh, at some length nowadays, and that is education, and that is it kind of feels like school in a way because school, yeah, you're kind of confined there, uh, and sometimes you have fun, most of the time you don't, but you're always learning. Or at least you're supposed to be learning, mm -hmm. and that's what it kind of feels like to me. Where, yeah, yeah, we we're we're definitely in here. I, you know, we're we're locked in, no question, uh, with with very limited ways out. But I, if it's far as you know, as far as being a sinister, horrible place where everybody's tortured all the time, I mean, everybody has their up days and their down days, but it just feels like it. Again, I'm trying to. Um, I, I see it as more of a. a a learning experience more than anything. Although there are a lot of people that aren't don't learn crap while they're in here. That's that's Ain't it the truth. Yeah, that's yeah. and it's a shame, but that seems so, to be the nature yeah. of the beast these days. Indeed. Um, I'm going to throw something at you, and I didn't warn you about this, so just take it with a grain of salt, okay? Oh no. <laughs> what? Okay, the theory that has been rattling around in my head relates to, um, and I thought of you when this came to me. Uh -huh. um, relates to the production of a video game okay um because that's your background yep um and so i'm i'm thinking in terms of a combination of a hollow deck and a video game sure and i think the you know because i i come from a long enjoyment of astronomy it was you know i followed that in college in high school uh, on my own it was space and time were so fascinating to me my whole life and so I start thinking holodeck, okay? That looks, yep. it looks real, it feels real. You can interact with it as though it's real. Yep. And yet all you do is say holodeck off and bam, you're on a platform. Yep. So there's part of me that thinks, okay, I know 100% without a, a shadow of a doubt that this is not a spinning, hurtling through space globe. So yes. I've knocked that out of the park. Um, I do believe it's a flat surface of some sort, but could not it be, because if we have superior beings out there 
observing us through the the snow globe mm -hmm. could it could it not be that they have the capacity to holo holodeck on holodeck off uh, change the nature of our experience here. Um, deja vu things make way more sense in a, in a context like that. Yes. Um, and then from the video point of view, I think of the movie Tron. And, and the reason I'm, you know, going to the media and to the movies is because, like you said, art imitates life. And mm -hmm. I believe that these people, these entities, these parasites, these vultures, whatever they are, mm -hmm. um, have really enjoyed screwing with our heads. And for some, you know, sad, pathetic reason, but could, you know, I guess I'm asking you, do you, would you take it that far to consider that as a possibility? Oh, absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, the, yeah, and, and I think, yeah, when you're talking about the holodeck, you're talking about the uh, Star Trek Next Generation yes. holodeck series, yeah. yeah, which, and they did some wonderful episodes on on that where the holodeck was, and which was very interesting because the holodeck has to be a square room, mm -hmm. but inside that square room, you can do anything you want, which kind of reminds me of Rob Skiba's model, where in his model, and I should really touch on this more if I get a chance, is uh, is was a domed structure inside a big square structure so it was uh you know so even though we perceive it as like yeah so it's got circular edges but it's inside a square room because machines do not think in circles machines think in squares okay uh, because it's precise you don't we we it's so like for example uh people don't understand what i'm talking about if you ask a computer to draw a circle a computer can't draw a circle it has to draw little steps little jagged lines around the outer edge which are imperceivable to our naked eye we can draw a circle without doing anything because we just draw it. Mm -hmm. We don't have to we don't have to think about it, but computers cannot do that. But yeah, the holodeck the holodeck model because the, the holodeck's fascinating because really it delves into what is matter. Right. Uh, if if things can be conjured that are physical items that you can pick up and touch, what is that different from from what we perceive as reality? Mm -hmm. And then you go into what is reality. So yes, very possible that where we are is, and, and I touched on that in one of the most recent episodes I did, which which was called um, a Masonic Flat Earth, where I think at the highest level the Masons believe that we are in some sort of simulation, that we are in some sort of game, and that everything was kind of created uh, where you enter and leave this giant building which I'm more and more trying to because the, the giant building that you go into to perceive where you are now doesn't have to be a domed structure mm -hmm. it can be a big square room in fact if it is a machine if it is like a, you know there are Hollywood backlots which which was made the Truman show unique from other Hollywood backlots most of your Hollywood studios are giant square rooms yes like like the Boeing factory where they make airplanes uh, those are big square rooms the only thing that was different was the uh, the Truman show they made it a giant domed room to kind of help simulate the star the star in the skies mm, okay so, yeah but yeah absolutely possible you bet Okay, well, good. I'm glad to know I'm not a total nut job. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I'm totally on board with you on that one. Okay, so the other thing is my question about some people are, are questioning the possibility, and I guess I'm entertaining that, that because this has gotten so big so fast, yes. that perhaps this was intended for us to find. Um, and I'm basing that premise upon the, the uh, 1980 Steve Jackson Illuminati deck that has a flat earth card. Yeah. Um, and it has a, a moon landing card. And, it, and you know, it, if, if whoever made the deck was just prophetic, they were awfully damn close. Yeah. Um, but if they were those who were working the system to expose things at certain periods of time that would benefit them to keep our eye off another ball or to watch the other hand yeah then i'm wondering if maybe this was intended to happen um it, or because it's just gotten so big so fast they can't control it i'm not quite sure what to think it about feels, it feels i i there's two ways i can go with this um and yeah i know which i know the illuminati illuminati card that you're talking about uh which is really fascinating considering it was quite a few years ago yeah where it said people laugh I mean, the, the fact that they dedicated a card to the flat earthers one was amazing. Yeah. Uh, and it's and the the opening line, if I get it right, is people laugh, but the but the flat earthers know something. Exactly. And I quoted it here in my notes because I wanted to make sure we recognized that that was 
the premise upon which the card was created. Yeah. And when you recognize that this is a card game and that you're penalized when you know stuff and you're, are, you're uh, rewarded when you know stuff and you're penalized yeah. when you don't, that's yeah. how they set the game up. I guess you get to move five spaces ahead and, and get yeah. all these advantages because yep. you're a flat earther and you know stuff. Yep. So I guess I'd just like some feedback it's, from you on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, um, okay, so there's two ways you can go with this. One is because you're, you're absolutely right. There's no uh, – the, the quote you've heard me say it time and time again, and that is, I believe in coincidences. I've just never seen one. Uh, that applies here, and that is one of two things. Either the powers that be, and I call them the authority, either the authority helped this topic get the traction that it has – which is, again, why this year? Why? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the uptick, if you go on YouTube now, for example, uh, um, if you search Flat Earth, before this whole thing started, there was, what, 40,000, 50,000 hits? Yeah. As of today, there's like 1.6 million yep. hits hits on this thing. That's in, what, ten, less than 10 months? Yes. That's not That's not natural. It's a massive, massive increase. But the other side is, did they know about it? Did they, did they have advanced knowledge? Meaning, did they, uh, from a from a time travel standpoint, did they have did an algorithm predict it for them? Did some magic, you know, somebody predict? You know, was there a, a prophecy involved? You don't know, but they they know about it. So now, can they deal with it? I don't know. Uh, you know, if you believe in, you know, we've seen this in movies before. The the really, if if your opponent is very well prepared, then they knew this was coming way way in advance. But can they stop it or are they helping it move forward? I don't know. It feels to me sometimes, and again, you know me, I'm a, I'm a glass half full type of guy. Yeah. It feels like a setup sometimes. It feels like this topic is being allowed because let's let's be let's be honest here. They could have crushed this thing. They could have they could have buried it in in social media if they wanted to. They could have gone to me or any of the other flat earthers and and just to date, no flat earthers have disappeared. Or anything like that, and nobody's like reversed and said, "Nope, the flat Earth's complete fake." I mean, it just keeps gaining more and more traction. So I think they know about it. They they, they definitely know about it. The question is, did they have a hand in it? I don't know. Okay, because I guess to take that to the next logical step for me, it would be okay if they knew about it and they set the table for it, or they were just prepared when it came about. Yeah. Then are they admitting that maybe uh, NASA is going to be taken down or that that you could you could use nasa as a scapegoat in mm -hmm. this case yeah. but everybody i mean i am absolutely in the minority when i say that yes it would be nice if if nasa got got crushed on this one but the knowing men in power and i'm speaking men in power mm -hmm. they won't let that happen the 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 class action lawsuits the loss of university programs uh, the l loss of faith in science uh, would be too much for them to handle unless they came out with a, a distraction that was bigger than it. Uh, yeah, it, which uh, could possibly be this whole alien disclosure there you stuff go. that they're, you know, they're tapping around the circle trying to soft disclosure kind of routine. Um, yeah, there's, there's only two things I could think of that could even slow this thing down from a distraction. One is a, a massive war involving big, big countries, big players, or... Uh, an alien disclosure process mm -hmm. of some kind. Gee, a big war with big countries. Gee, like maybe uh, Russia and <coughs> United States? Yeah, maybe. Hmm, go figure. Throw, throw, throw China into the mix? Could uh -huh. have something there. Yeah. Because yeah. I was just, you know, there was, there's always this part of me that that wants to circle around a subject and look at it from every vantage point. And, and it's pretty much like what you said. When you look at it from the the strategy of are they going to forsake all the money that they've built us out of? Uh, are they going to drop university programs and grants and projects? And I mean, good grief, we've got this silly Mars thing going on that looks oh, to me yeah. like uh, it's being filmed elsewhere. And our, our buddy Jaron has kind of <laughs> exposed yeah. that little goody. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess it's just one of those day-by-day -day things, which that which big issue could take people's eye off this ball? Yeah. Um, they're if they're going to do it, they're going to have to do it quick, though, because it's gotten so entrenched in social media mm -hmm. that it, we don't even need the mainstream, to be honest, at this point. The way it's spreading on, uh, on Facebook and Twitter, and the only thing I've been waiting for lately is to have some celebrity accidentally 
post something, you know, like get real drunk and outraged and say, oh, this flatter stuff is stupid and fire it off to six, six, ten million people at one crack. <laughs> And see what happens because, because it'll get it'll get retweeted i guarantee it and it's really interesting that nobody's none of nobody with any big fan bases has, has done this yet and uh that's that's the next thing for me yeah that would do it a yeah. um, couple things that i wanted to just mention that i that i've been watching that i thought were hilarious um after NASA released that second blue marble picture, it wasn't, if I remember right in the chronology, it wasn't too long before they also produced that stupid cartoon of the moon transit. Oh, the South Park moon flyby? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That was the worst thing ever. That was some of the worst animation I've ever seen ever. Uh, yeah. You know, I think a, a sixth grader doing CGI studies could have done better than that. Yep. Um, so that was another. See, this is something that horrible makes me wonder if they're being sloppy on purpose, if they're just in a rush to try to, to, to quell the movement, or what the dynamic was there, because that was just ridiculous. You, again, you could go both ways on that, because, yeah, did they have to... The thing is, you've got the money, you've got the people to do it, so why not do, like, a slow transit instead of that, you know, big, chunky, horrible perspective thing from a satellite that no one had heard about? It was, oh, yeah, by the way, it's exactly a million miles out. They did it, you, you, and you dumb it down. A million miles, not 950,000, <laughs> not some weird number. No, an even million miles, because people know what a million is. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous that whole story i hated it and then we've got uh the up close and personal picture of pluto with the pro oh. the profile of the disney dog oh yeah that Seriously. was that was awful and the fact they just released a picture this week a close-up even a, a bigger a, a more higher resolution close-up of pluto just recently where and it's going really how, what's lighting this thing <laughs> How is it so well lit? How is it so detailed? How are you transferring the data back? Because because you got to remember that Pluto is billions of right. miles away. It's not millions or hundreds of millions. It's billions of miles away. How are you getting these images? Uh, and it's, it's oh, it's just it's just ridiculous. So every time I see a story, because I, I predicted it, I said, look, this is the only thing they can do, because they can't go. You can't go to the mainstream media and come up with. And, and drag Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill the Nye, the science guy, you can't drag them on stage and start talking about it because if you do, then you're talking about it. That's and right, you, yes. You, can't, you cannot allow it to talk about it. The only thing you can do is just reinforce the globe as fast as you can, and that means basically run a space story. In fact, uh, uh, the um, that shooting in California, the, the day after, there was a, uh, um, a Pluto, that high-res Pluto thing I was telling you about. Yes. That was running side-by-side side with the California thing. It was on the front page of CNN. I was going, why would you ever put this? The whole front page should be nothing but California, and you're actually putting the Pluto thing right there? No. Uh, no there's there's no accidents. To, yeah, trying to control things that, that even they are not too well at control. Yeah. And uh, loose. Yes, exactly. Um, the nonsense on board ISS, um, yeah. where, you know, they're – they're playing their guitar simultaneously with some orchestra on earth or something with no feedback problems, no time lapse problems. Yeah. Um, that's hilarious. Uh, the premise upon which uh, we could be using a squeeze bottle of ketchup in an ISS. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. the women with their hair teased and hairsprayed to make it look like they're in, you know, some kind of zero yeah. grav. I mean, yeah. it's hilarious. And yeah. then and the go ahead. Oh, the, the door hatches. That, that was between, what I was going to say, yeah. Between compartments that aren't there, and even if I, they are there, they're so buried that you have no access to anything. It's one single micromedia hits, and all these guys, uh, you'll see a bunch of dead astronauts in khakis and polo shirts and socks just kind of floating around. Why, why are they in khakis and polo shirts and socks? Nobody's ever in a, in a space suit. We're trying to, you know, I would be in a spacesuit at all times trying to repair stuff. And that, th th I had the industrial engineer send me that statement, and he works for, um, a, a, he, he specializes in seals and valves. Yes. And he went on record and said, the ISS is impossible. It is impossible for what they're advertising it. He goes, the, the, the maintenance on that thing would be excruciatingly uh, long term. It would just you'd be constantly maintaining stuff. You'd have a crew up there that'd be working on it. Not not to mention the complete overhaul you'd have to do every so many years. Uh, and not only that, he goes the seals and the valves don't make sense. There's no machine shop on the 
on the on the International Space Station. And the submarine guy chimed in as well. He goes, yeah, and because most people don't know on big ships like that or even, you know, moderately sized Navy ships, you have full blown machine shops to make pieces from scratch because you always need pieces that you don't have. Right. Uh, and and what are you going to do? Send somebody to the grocery store from the ISS yeah. to pick up a grommet? Yeah, you yeah. Know? It goes where? Where's the maintenance? It, there's there's no maintenance on this thing, and it's well, uh, and not to mention how horrific it must smell in there. Oh, oh, oh my don't, gosh. don't get me <laughs> don't don't get me started on that. Yeah, uh, for, yeah. Forget about the, the the droplets of sweat. You know, it's like <laughs> it's like you're you're working out on a treadmill. Really, really, you're gonna let sweat just fly around? Uh, the women with the long hair. The same rules apply as in a swimming pool. If you have a lot, you you would never allow. In fact, you wouldn't allow hair. You would have everyone would have their hair head shaved, or they'd be wearing skull caps mm -hmm. because hair floating around it'd be like you'd be floating around running into spider webs. That's why you don't allow long hair in swimming pools. That's why you would not allow it on the ISS. And their answer was, let's just perm the hair. To f that's what we'll do from a production standpoint. It was ridiculous. Well, and not to mention that if you got a hair in between point A and point B that had to mesh and match perfectly, yep, you'd be screwed. Yeah, it'd be gross. That whole place would be disgusting. Okay, well, I think we've we've uh, adequately covered that. Um, oh, I guess the last <laughs> thing I'd like to mention is the uh, the disclosure of the space shuttle astronauts um, who are still very much alive and teaching in university. Oh yeah, yeah, the Challenger program, mm -hmm. and that was a neat one. I didn't find that. Somebody else found it. Again, that's the internet. Remember the internet hive mind. I said it before and I'll say it again. The Internet Hive Mind misses nothing. Yeah. They will find any, if you are on the Internet in any w capacity, they will find it eventually. Um, there was a, the Challenger astronauts supposedly died in 1986. Everyone remembers the Challenger uh, uh, space shuttle went up, blew up, right? Yeah. The problem is, is that if the space program is fake, you never, ever put astronauts on the top of anything, especially a whole big pile of liquid explosives which are going to light on fire mm -hmm. uh that's the last thing you're ever going to do so if something goes wrong unfortunately you got to do something with the astronauts because yeah. well, the shuttle blew up well yeah but your astronauts are sitting right here in another room eating snacks so what, <laughs> what are you going to do with them you could either capricorn one of them and try to kill them but you know what they're they're kind of good sports and you've been they've been working for you let's just do the witness relocation thing mm -hmm. so they they just send them out into the world, and since the internet wasn't created until half way later, they they didn't get it. So all of a sudden, people start looking up, and most of them didn't even really change their names that much. No. They used the middle name or something else, and two of them claimed to be the Japanese one and the black guy. They claimed claimed to be uh, twin brothers exactly. of their of their of their dead astronaut counterparts. Uh, and what was it? Six out of the seven. Six out of the seven they found. Yes. You know they they know exactly where they are. They're teaching. They're all pretty. You know high profile positions at universities mm -hmm. and what's interesting about these guys is they have all of them have they're not generic mcplain rap people these, <laughs> these, these people have unique looking faces yes teeth jaw eyes and when you look at the photographs and compare them to the people and they all age the coincidence that they aged exactly like you would expect them to age you're looking and you're going how how well how did they think they were gonna they were gonna pull this off but they did and for uh, quite it, some time yep, yeah yeah for quite, for quite some, some time 30 years as a matter of fact and uh it worked out brilliantly so yeah uh the nasa program has been an absolute for for people who do not get exactly what i'm trying to lay out here has been an absolute fabrication since it was created in 1958 the entire point of nasa is to hide the world from which you live People, they, NASA's whole job is to keep you from figuring out that you are not in a little tiny speck of dust flying through the cosmos. Accidental but, speck of dust, by accidental, the way. Accidental, yes. yeah, completely random. No one created this place. It was completely science-based and and uh, just this w weird luck uh, that, we're, that we're here. That is not the case. You are all special and you are all inside, uh, let's just call it God's house. Well, for lack of a better way to describe it, I'll go with that because there's, there's definitely a creator. Um, this is not accidental, and maybe it was intersected just a bit by some 
some creepazoids who wanted to keep us here. I don't know, but creepazoids, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're at the end of the hour, and boy, did we do good for an hour. I'll tell you what, we covered just about everything I wanted to cover. So, uh, really appreciate it, Mark. And as usual, I'm going to ask you to stay in touch, and I will do the same. And uh, you just keep doing what you're doing because, my gosh, you have lit a fire under a generation and it has just been so much fun to be a part of and to observe this so i really really appreciate that and and i'm grateful to have you back tonight thank you thank you very much for having me and uh, for the, all the kind words it's what's keeping keeps me going and will you make sure that you publicize very well when your debate is scheduled and you know if there's any changes in that with with stanton friedman okay you you bet okay thanks so much mark we'll talk to you soon and I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact Mark. Uh, you can go to any of his Flat Earth Clues, and at the end he gives his phone number and his email address. And he's very, very good at getting back to people. Uh, you can also leave comments on YouTube videos and what have you. And uh, just keep on exposing people. And I would, I would beg you, please, once you know the the truths of what this world is please find a way to manifest it into some action because we are all getting to the point of overwhelm and burnout with the awareness that we have what are we going to do about it in 2016 2016 is the year of action and it must be we'll see you next week